a child of God. How his love comes over me stealing, making my pathway brighter grow as on I plod. Every day I'll tell the old story of his love I'll ever see. It's a grand and glorious feeling just to be walking with my King. Good singing. Thank you. All right, preacher. I'm glad I am a child of the King, aren't you? Thank God. Good to be saved and know the Lord. He's your Father, Jesus, your Savior, the Holy Spirit, your best friend. I'm thankful. We're in good shape tonight, you know. I know the world would have us to say and have us to believe that things are bad and falling apart, but the church isn't going down. The churches are going up. Amen. We're in good shape tonight. And I'm thankful that you're here. Pray the Lord will bless you uh, for being here tonight. You honor your faithfulness. And I know we've got uh, several things to be mindful of in prayer. Brother Terry uh, Douglas just texted me a minute ago. They're stuck on Highway 78 uh, around the flea market. I believe he said a bad wreck there. And so uh, he said, I don't know if we'll make it. Probably won't. So remember them and uh, those involved in that accident. Please uh, pray for those folks tonight. All right, let me give you some updates here. Uh, the best that I uh, have as of uh, this afternoon. Uh, do continue, of course, to remember Brother Bernie in prayer and uh, Miss Sherry as well. Pray for them. Uh, Miss Dana. Uh, Jennifer Eason, uh, she got a good report. They got her other pathology report back, and it didn't change the diagnosis. It's still uh, stage four. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver, but they told her that it wasn't uh, so bad that she would have to get a transplant. They uh, said there's a new medicine now and that she qualifies for, and they're saying that she could live another 20, 30 years on this medication, not have any problems. And so we thank the Lord for that. He answered a prayer. Amen. And we thank God. Brother Harvey called me last night just rejoicing over that. So uh, we certainly do thank the Lord for that. Continue. Remember, Miss Patsy. Uh, in prayer as well, and Nancy Barrymore, continuing to lift her up uh, to the Lord. Miss Nancy Jones is uh, still awaiting the results of her biopsy, so pray for her. Um, Brother Gary Holtzclaw, I called him yesterday, hadn't seen him in a couple of weeks, and uh, he's been having some trouble. He thinks it's some scar tissue of a heart uh, procedure that he had done several years ago. He's going, I believe, tomorrow or maybe Friday, he's going uh, to get that checked out. So remember the Gary uh, in prayer. He uh, hadn't really been feeling good, so lift him up to the Lord, if you would, tonight. Miss Betty Alexander, of course, continue to lift her up uh, to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Carrie Barr, uh, Taz Latham, Greg Garrett, Richard Barner, Dawn Kaiser, and Brother Robert's cousin, Gary Hopkins. Uh, remember these, and of course, Kim's uh, Kim Houston's brother David, continue to lift him up to the Lord in prayer as well, all right? Pray for Ukraine and all that's going on there in that region around the world. Uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray that God will protect his people. We know that he will, but we're commanded to pray for him in uh, Psalm 126. So we need to pray for uh, that city and pray for God's peace and his protection upon that land. But do pray for those Folk in Ukraine, that man, uh, the leader of Russia, he's beginning to reveal his true colors, what most everybody knew he was all along. He's a former member of the KGB. He's, uh, I mean, he's, he likes that old, uh, old regime of the Soviet Union, and now it's just coming to light. So pray that God will protect. There's missionaries there. Uh, there are Christian people there. Saved people love the Lord. We need to pray for them and pray God's hand of protection around those folks tonight, all right? Pray for our president. I didn't vote for him, but I try my best to pray for him. Somebody help me right there, amen? And uh, I won't vote for him again if he runs because I don't agree with the 
platform that he stands on. It's not because he's a Democrat, but he stands for things that ain't found in this Bible, so I can't vote for him. Y'all get quiet if you want to, amen, but I, I'll just say it out there. I told our church uh, back in 2016, I said, you know, everybody jumped on board behind a president uh, that took a stand, but nobody wants a preacher to take a stand. Well, I'm gonna take a stand, amen? Uh, like it or not, from hair lips the devil, truth's the truth, amen. Uh, but we do need to pray for these leaders and, and uh, pray for those who are in authority. Pray that God would work in their heart and uh, God would turn this thing around. I know that he certainly can. So let's remember these things tonight by way of prayer. Does anybody have an update or anything we need to add tonight to our prayer list? Anybody have one ready? Yes, sir. Tomorrow, all right, March. that's March the 3rd, all right, I remember that. Remember Billy in prayer, Brother Jerry? Amen. Good. Good, good. Praise the Lord. I know that was a blessing to them. Uh, you going by, Miss Kim's going to go by, and we got a basket for them we're going to take to them uh, tomorrow. So I know that means a lot to them and continue to lift them up. I know they would be here if they were able. I know that much. And so pray for burning share. Anybody else tonight? And anything we need to add, update? Yes, sir. Jane, Jane Robinson. All right. Let's lift this, let's lift this dear lady up to the Lord in prayer as well. All right. Of course, remember all of our missionaries tonight, and I'll go ahead and take a minute uh, just to read them. Uh, the Good Samaritan Center, Rock of Ages, Prison Ministry, Calvary Children's Home, the Crisis Pregnancy Center, uh, the radio station uh, there in Douglasville, Brother David Epps, uh, the Coker family to China, the Brown family to Turkey, Shoemates with Rock of Ages, the Pontus family to Mexico, the Loonies to Indonesia, and the Croker family to Bolivia. Let's lift all these folks up uh, in prayer. I've talked to most of them and the ones that were trying to get to the field that COVID kind of uh, put a damper on. Uh, their visas and such are being uh, in the works now, so pray that all those things will go through and be approved and uh, they'll be able to get to the field. Those that are have raised enough money on deputation uh, to begin to get to the field. Pray that all that uh, just goes through and pray the Lord's hand of blessing upon these missionaries. I mentioned the pregnancy center. We've been collecting those baby bottles for the month of February and we're, we're still missing nine baby bottles. We don't know where they are. Uh, we don't know if somebody took them, forgot about them or somebody took them, didn't fill them up, but we're missing those nine and we need those turned in by Sunday morning. So if you have one uh, laying around, maybe one rolled under your seat in your car you forgot about, uh, maybe one's in your recliner or in your, in your sofa at home and you thought that's a remote control and it's a baby bottle done slid down in there. But if you could, uh, whether it's filled or not, please uh, try to get that in because they will uh, charge us for those baby bottles uh, if they're not all counted for. So please, if you can bring those Sunday and we have a preliminary total of uh, what we collected here it was $915 in change that we collected. I don't know how many bottles that was. I don't know how many was involved in that, but when it was all uh, totaled so far, that's without the nine that are missing, but $915 in pennies and quarters and nickels and dimes. Ain't that a blessing, amen? And that can, that'll sure be a help to that work there uh, in Douglasville. We support that work because they're pro-life. And we believe this Bible's pro-life. We believe God's pro-life. And so that's why we support that work. And, and I know that uh, that will go a long way in the ministry that God has called them to do there. So I want to thank everybody again for uh, your participation. And please, if you got one, please 
uh, get it here by Sunday morning, all right? Let me go ahead and make mention of the rest of the announcements, get them out of the way. Uh, the men's meeting Saturday morning, 9 o'clock. Uh, if you hadn't yet planned on coming, we'd love to have you. We'll have a good time of fellowship and food together, time in the Word of God. And uh, we won't be here long, but it'll be good and profitable time. So 9 o'clock Saturday morning. And if you hadn't signed up for the boating for brothers there, uh, please do that. And we'll get that uh, rolling here in the next couple of months. It's in June, but that'll be here uh, before we know it. So if you want to... Uh, if you haven't yet signed up, please go ahead and do that. We'll, uh, we'll make arrangements and make sure we got enough room for everybody. And also the Wednesday night meal will start next Wednesday night on the 9th. And if you can sign up there in the Welcome Center on the sign-up sheet, if you can bring a dish, soup, sandwiches, dessert, whatever, if you can bring something, that would be a big help. If you have any questions, you see Sister Chris. She's kind of uh, heading that up. We'll try it. Uh, once a month for right now and see how it goes. Uh, hopefully it'll be a help to folk that just get off work and maybe that'll take some excuse away from some of them that say they don't have time to get off work and go get something to eat and come. Well, we'll feed you on Wednesday night and uh, that'll take that excuse. That's one less excuse you got to take away. Amen. I had a fellow one time tell me, he said, Preacher, I can't come. says, if I walked in that door, that roof would fall in. The next Sunday, I had a whole chair of hard hats sitting back there waiting on him. Praise God. We'll take that excuse away. Amen. Praise the Lord. There's one lady, seriously, Kim, remember this? She was not physically able uh, to sit. We had pews back then, and she could not sit on those old hard benches. And she come to me and said, Preacher, would you mind if, if I, I brought a recliner or, or something? I said, I don't care. Just come. So she sure did wheeled that recliner in there. I thought, you know, I read somewhere in the Bible one time about a fellow that was laying on a bed. He couldn't get to Jesus, and they tore the roof off. Lord, I guess if somebody came to church in a bed, somebody could come in a recliner. Amen? So uh, no excuses. We need to have a no-excuse Sunday around here. No excuses. For those that say they like to sleep in, we ought to move it to about noon, which I don't know why you couldn't be here at 1030. That's plenty of sleep. Somebody help me right there. Amen? You go to bed at 9.30, you go to bed at 1.30 in the morning and get about seven hours sleep, still be here for Sunday school. Then you go home and take a nap. Y'all get quiet now, but you know I'm telling it right, amen. And uh, have no excuse Sunday, have a meal. Say, well, uh, my roast will burn. That's all right, we'll take care of that. We'll feed you after church if you come. And, and uh, just have a no excuse. I'm sick of excuses, aren't you? That's what COVID was for two years. The devil gave an excuse. They didn't have to come up with one. Now that's kind of dying down, and so they're having to dig back in the old file cabinet now and try to come up with one, but we need to have a no excuse Sunday. Amen. I believe that God be in that. Hallelujah. All right. People say, well, the preacher's too loud. I'd tone it down for them just on Sunday. Service too long. We'll cut it off about 10 minutes. Service too short, we'll lengthen it at about 30 minutes. Whatever. No excuse Sunday. Amen. I'm feeling God on that the more I talk about it. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Yes, sir, Brother Jerry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. At six o'clock, yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Lord willing, if it all works out, we'll keep keep that the first Monday night of every month, and that'll give some of our preachers in our church, an opportunity to preach, singers to sing. We have to be done by 8 o'clock, so you'll be back by 8.30 probably, 8.45 at the latest, if you, play, if you could go. But we have to be done by 8 so those men can get to other places uh, that they need to go uh, before they shut down. But it'll be, it'll be a blessing. And I promise you this, you'll come away, you'll be thanking God for how good he's been to you that we're not homeless, and the only difference between me and them is the grace of God. That's it. 
Hey, that's the only reason I'm not on the street tonight, the only reason you're not on the street. God has been good to us, and, and so we need, to, uh, we need to surely reach out and try to be a help and encouragement uh, to those folks. We'd love to have you come. If you won't come, and just get in the amen corner. We need that too, amen. Uh, but it'd be a good showing for our church. The more we have, I know it'd be a blessing to those men there, and I hope we can become a, a good part of that work that they're doing down there. All right, anybody else tonight? Any other prayer request, a word of testimony? In the morning, I failed to mention, 1030, uh, the senior adult Bible study. You, Brother Jerry's back. They all laid out last week because they got word that I was teaching. Brother Jerry's back. If you're watching tonight and you, you're not here tonight and you come on Thursday morning, you go ahead and know Brother Jerry's here. You can come on in the morning. Amen. You don't have to hear the preacher on Thursday morning. You can come. Brother Jerry will be locked and loaded. But 1030 in the morning, uh, you be found faithful and be in uh, your place. That is a good ministry because we do have some folks that aren't able to drive at night, and I understand that. The older I get, the more I understand that, especially with all these new uh, lights that they put on these vehicles. Boy, they drive. I, listen, Kim will tell you, there's been times I put my sunglasses on at night because them lights drive me crazy. So I understand that. So it's good to have that uh, available for them on Thursday morning and have, usually have a good, good number. And so I hope you'll be faithful and be in your place in the morning. All right? Well, there you go. If you couldn't hear that online, blueberry coffee cake in the morning and the, the, the warm bread of the Word of God. Amen? He'll probably have a little coffee on. Amen. Some maybe what goes with blueberry coffee, cobbler cake, milk, coffee. There you go. There you go. Some hot chocolate, I guess. Cappuccino. Crank that slushy machine up in there. They'll drink a slushy. Amen. We'll get them high on sugar. Praise God. Amen. Good time of fellowship. I, I've always enjoyed. My time that I get uh, to, to, to be with the folks and share, we always have a good Bible study together. It's a good time. So I hope if you're able to come, you'll come in the morning at 1030. All right, anybody else tonight need a prayer, word of praise, announcement, anything we need to mention? Of course, Sunday morning, uh, be in your place. Lord willing, a week from Sunday, Brother Robert will be walking through that liquid grave back there, have some of his family here and uh, to, to witness that wonderful event. And uh, then we're going to have on March the 27th, after the morning service, the deacons and I are going to serve our widows and our widowers. We have about 10 of them, best I know, 10 or 11. Uh, widow, we have a couple of widowers, men, but mostly are widows. And we're going to have a Sunday luncheon for you. After the service on that Sunday, the 27th, we're going to serve you and to let you know how much you mean to us and and let you know if there's anything we can do to help any uh, getting grass cutting time here before long and and we'll certainly come help you do what we can but that'll be March the 27th James said that's pure religion undefiled before God is to take care of the widows and and the fatherless and those that are in need and so uh, if we want to claim to have the real thing we better do what the Bible says we need to do should we not amen so we're going to do our best to try to minister to uh, to those folks so I hope and pray you'll make plans to be in your place. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Let's ask his uh, blessing on these that we've mentioned tonight. And, of course, I know there's many unspoken requests. And those that are watching tonight, if you have a prayer need, you'll uh, comment there. We'll certainly get that on our prayer sheet, and we'll agree with you uh, together. I was talking to Miss Barbara Rainey today. She had called me into last week with a, with a personal uh, private prayer matter, and uh, so I called her this morning to check with her and see how things went and how uh, what what uh, good report was, and she was just rejoicing in the Lord how that God had taken care of it, and and uh, and she said, preacher, she said, you know, I, I, God began to reveal to me maybe all the things we've missed out on. She because she told me she said, I don't want you to say anything because I feel like what I'm going through is very small 
compared to we got folks that are dealing with death and folks that are at the point of death and folks with cancer. And she said, so what I'm dealing with seems so very small compared to, to everybody else. And I said, oh, Miss Barbara, uh, to God, there's no big things or any little things. Uh, if, it's, if it's big enough to be a care, it's big enough to be a prayer. And uh, so as she told me today, she said, you know, God reminded me that uh, we have not because we ask not. And we have a promise that if we call unto him, he will answer us. And I shared with her, she said, you know, preacher, she said, I know that Bible says that the Lord knows what we need even before we ask. I said, that's the key, before we ask. He already knows even before, that, shouldn't, that doesn't mean I shouldn't ask because he already knows, but because he knows, I ought to ask even more with confidence according to 1 John 5 that if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. And God specializes in hearing and answering prayer. So thank God tonight for that. Let's go to him in prayer tonight. Brother Dorsey, if you'll take us to the throne of grace and ask God's will to be done, please, sir. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes. Yes, Lord. Oh, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, we do. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Well, you know where to go on Wednesday night, the book of Romans. And it's going to get a little better now. I know some of you uh, thought that we're about ready to probably blow your brains out after the first three chapters when Paul shows us how bad off we are. And a lot of these preachers on TV try to convince you how good you are. They don't read the same Bible I read. Uh, Paul's telling us that we're, we're sorry, we're low down, we're sinners, we're guilty before God, none righteous, no, not one. But now we come to chapter 4, and his emphasis changes a little bit. This would be probably the faith chapter of the book of Romans. And in fact, I want to uh, just borrow the uh, title of that great old hymn and that red back book there tonight for chapter 4 of the book of Romans. And the Lord being my helper Take these verses tonight and preach on living by faith and hopefully God will uh, seal his word to our heart tonight. This is a wonderful, wonderful chapter. Probably what Hebrews 11 is to the hall of faith of those in the pages of God's word in days gone by. Probably uh, Romans chapter 4 rivals very closely to that as it begins to demonstrate uh, faith and uh, saving faith and, and securing faith. And Paul is driving home the point that the only way to heaven, the way of salvation, is not a guessing game. It's not a hope so salvation. It's not a uh, maybe so salvation. We don't get to heaven by trying. We get to heaven by trusting. We get to heaven by trusting in the finished work of Calvary of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, notice how he ends chapter 3 there. Uh, again, in verse 22, he says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all them that believe, for there is uh, no difference. Now, chapter 1, he talks to the Gentiles. Chapter 2, he talks to the Jews. Chapter 3, he puts us all together that we're all guilty before God. And now in chapter 4, he's going 
going to show that Jew and Gentile, the only way that they can get to God is by faith. It is declared and it is there's no difference. It is declared unto us all. So as we begin chapter 4, I want to call your attention to a couple of words that are very key words. You'll find the first word in verse number 4. It's the word reckon. You'll find the next word in verse number 5. It's the word counted. And then the next word in verse number 8, and it is the word impute. You've got reckon, you've got counted, and you've got impute. All three of those words are, were banking terms, accounting uh, words in the days of the text. And they describe a credit or a transfer, a credit to the account of another person. So Paul is reminding us that's what Jesus did at the cross. When I come to him and I uh, place my faith in the finished work of Calvary and the finished work of the cross... Here's what God did. He made a transfer. He took my sin and he transferred it to Jesus, but he took his righteousness and he transferred that unto me. And he imputed unto me, not my sin, but he imputed unto me his grace and his mercy and his salvation. So I want to give you three things tonight about faith that are described in Romans chapter uh, number four. The first one is found as we begin in verse number one. I want to say a word tonight about simple faith. And it is very simple. And I believe Paul makes it uh, very simple. He goes back and he uses a couple of Old Testament patriarchs that everybody's familiar with, one by the name of Abraham and the other by the name of David. And he uses those two Old Testament giants to demonstrate what real faith is and how simple true faith in God uh, really is. Both of these men, Abraham and David, both were sinners, yet divine righteousness was reckoned unto them, not by any merit of their own, but by simple faith of believing in God. And we, like Abraham and like David, we're going to heaven the same way that they're going to heaven. That's by faith, trusting in the finished work of Calvary, believing God. And when that happens, his righteousness is imputed unto our account. Well, why did God set it up so simple? I, I've had people tell me, preacher, it's just so simple. You're telling me all I have to do is believe and with my heart and confess uh, with my mouth that Jesus raised from the dead. It's so simple. And my all common response is, well, God's already taken care of the hard part. Why would he make it hard on you? It's as simple as a small child can believe and have enough faith to trust. In fact, did not Jesus say, except you have faith like one of these little children, you'll in no wise enter uh, the kingdom of heaven. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm glad God did make it simple. Amen? He made it simple for a dummy like me that where I could get in and understand that all I had to do was put my faith and my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, why did God set it up that way? Look at verse 1. I would suggest for one reason so that boasting is excluded. He says, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining uh, to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham uh, believed God, and it was counted unto him uh, for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace uh, but of debt but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness here's what Paul is saying if Abraham was saved by his works then Abraham could have taken credit for his own salvation but Paul is saying in order to be saved by works and if you could be uh, saved by works you could brag and boast and if we could work to be saved, God would owe us something and it would no longer be grace but it would be a debt because God would be indebted to me if I could earn and work and merit up my way to heaven. But we don't work to get saved. Uh, we work because we're saved. Let me say that again. We don't work to get saved but we work because we're saved. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. 
lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath foreordained before the world began, not by works of righteousness of which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us, and he redeemed us, and regenerated us by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. If I could have earned my salvation, Jesus would have never had to come, he would have never had to die, and I could earn my way to God and work my way to heaven, but since I can't work my way to heaven, I can't brag and boast on anything that I've ever done. I simply have to claim that when I get to heaven, I'll only be there by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the good grace and the mercy of God. Boasting is excluded. But look at verse number four or five. Not only is boasting excluded, but blessing is included. Now jump down to verse six. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Everybody remembers King David, the greatest king in Israel's history. For 33 years, he ruled like no other. But David had a couple of chinks in his armor, didn't he? He was an adulterer, and he was a murderer. You say, well, preacher, he didn't, he didn't kill Uriah and all, but he was just as guilty as the man that fired the bow. He's an adulterer. He's a murderer. David didn't lose his salvation, and I think you'd agree with me. If adultery and murder couldn't make you lose your salvation, then what sin could? David didn't lose it, but in Psalm 51, he prayed, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He never lost the Jesus of his salvation. He lost the joy of his salvation. And so here he quotes in Romans 4, verse 7 and 8, he quotes Psalm 32. And in Psalm 32, David got hold of the fact that salvation is freely bestowed and sin is forever banished only through the mercy and through the grace of God. Thank God that blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Aren't you glad tonight that your sins are under the blood cast as far as the east is from the west never to be remembered anymore. God cast him behind his back. Thank God. You ask me why I'm happy. Then I'll just tell you why. It's because my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary as far removed as darkness is from dawn in the sea of God's forgetfulness. That's good enough for me. Hallelujah, my sins are gone. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Now, I know somebody's probably thinking, whether here or watching, well, now, preacher Abraham and David lived before Jesus died on the cross, and you'd be right. But they got saved the same way anybody gets saved after Jesus died on the cross. It's by putting their faith and their trust, believing the promise of God. They looked ahead to Jesus. We looked back to Jesus. They believed and were saved. We believe and are saved. It's simple faith. It's simple faith. You want to go to heaven? Just believe and receive the free gift of salvation. Y'all say amen tonight. I'm trying to calm down. I know it's Wednesday night, but I got one gear and it's half broke, hallelujah. So I'm just gonna enjoy myself, amen. Y'all look there tonight like you, uh, you lived in the lemon patch today, amen. Praise God, your sins are forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. Your name's written down in God's book in glory. Hallelujah, my sins are gone. And I got saved one day, wasn't because I was a good person, wasn't because I was a rich person, wasn't because I was a preacher's kid, wasn't because I was a Baptist. I got saved one day by simple faith. I trusted him. I believed. And thank God tonight our sins are gone. It's simple faith. Let me say a word number two. Not only about simple faith, but Paul says the word beginning verse nine about symbolic faith. Did you know one of the quickest ways you can find out what somebody's trusting for their salvation is to ask them what they're basing their salvation on? 
Ask somebody if you died today, would you go to heaven? Yes, I would. Well, how do you know that? And her answer, what they tell you reveals what kind of salvation. Some people would say, well, one day, preacher, my good will outweigh my bad. That's a works answer. They, they're, they're holding on to their works and their good life and their good living. Some people are saying, well, preacher, when I was just a little boy, there was a fellow with a, with a collar on his neck that called him mama, uh, Papa, but he dressed like Mama, and he took a little vial, and he sprinkled, well, some of y'all get that tonight on your way home, and he sprinkled a little water on my head, and they catechized me and circumcised me and sprinkled me, and because of that, I'm going to heaven. What they're doing is they are trusting an external work when salvation's an inside job. You put your faith and your trust, not in a church, not in a work, not in a deed, not in a lifestyle, but you put your faith and trust in the finished work of Calvary, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Well, Paul, in verse 9, he begins to pull the mask off all these religious rites that the Jews were holding on to. And beginning to look at it, he talks about the sign that established it. He said, come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? Was he in, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham which he had being yet I'm certain now you know this going back to the Old Testament circumcision was the, was the act God gave Abraham back in Genesis 17 and in the Old Testament it was a symbol of faith and obedience and commitment to God but there were Jews in that day you remember they came back to the early church in Acts 15 and they were trying to mix the doctrine of grace and salvation with the outward work of circumcision. So Paul is saying circumcision was just an act of believing. And every time that a child was circumcised, it was just an outward symbol of their commitment and their obedience to God. But the circumcision alone did not save them. It just proved that they were already saved. Here's the order. You've got faith. You believe that Jesus died and was buried and was rose again. That's faith. After faith comes justification. In the sight of God, God justifies you, cleanses you in the blood of his darling son, and washes you clean and puts on your robe of righteousness, and you're declared righteous and holy and justified in God's sight. So you've got faith. You've got justification. Then you've got the symbol. We don't believe practice the symbol of circumcision like they did in Bible days but today it would be the parallel of baptism. You get baptized that's an outward symbol of your obedience and of your faith and of your commitment and your profession to follow God and to live for God. But the Jews reversed the order. They put circumcision at the beginning and Paul is saying that symbolic faith cannot precede saving faith. Let me put it this way. The figure of getting baptized cannot go before the fact of getting born again. Why, if you're not saved when you get in that pool, all you'll do is go down a dry center and come up a wet center. That water doesn't save anybody. That water doesn't atone for anything, but it's an outward declaration. It's an outward profession of our faith that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, you've missed it if you're holding on to these outward rites and Rituals and rules and, and symbols of salvation. It's just a sign that God used in that day. Not to save them, but to prove that they were already saved. Look at verse number 13. There's not only the sign that establishes it, there's the seed that experiences it. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. 
to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father. You may want to underscore that phrase right there. Who is the father of us all? As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Abraham believed God, he was saved. When we, like Abraham, believe God, we're saved. And according to Paul, we become a part of the same family, Jew or Gentile. We trace it back to our spiritual father of our faith, a man by the name of Abraham. Amen. Have you ever thought about this, spiritually speaking? I don't know if you've ever tracked your family tree down. I did it several years ago. I gained a whole new appreciation for my heritage and my history and my ancestors, where they all migrated from there in Germany and then settled there in western North Carolina and then eventually up into eastern Kentucky. And I, I, I really was amazed at, at how God worked down through all those generations. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I can give you a real quick picture, Brother Rodney, of our spiritual family tree. You ready? Spiritually speaking, our father's Abraham. Our grandfather's Adam. And our great-grandfather's dirt. Dirt. Or I should say dust. God breathed into the nostrils in dust. You can do something with dirt. Only God could do something with dust. So the next time we think we really got something to brag about and boast about, you just be reminded, your father's Abraham, your grandfather's Adam, and your great-grandfather's dirt. We don't have anything to brag about. All that we have we owe to the goodness of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Well, I said all that tonight. I want to close in the verses, verse 18, following through the rest of the chapter tonight. And I want to say a word not only about simple faith and symbolic faith, but I want to close tonight saying a word about strong faith. I think you'd agree with me, we're saved by faith. We're secured by faith. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, 1 Peter 1, 5. But I'm not only saved by faith and secured by faith, I'm sustained by faith. The just shall live, how? By faith. I want to ask you a question tonight before we look at Abraham's example. I want to ask you, and I want you to be honest. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I've, I'm asking myself this question. So I want to ask you a question tonight. How would God rate your faith? Would God say you have a strong faith or a sick faith? Would God say you have a mighty faith or a meager faith? Would God, and, and by the way, God is the only one that would really know. Do you have a bold faith or a broken faith? Well, he gives us an example of a man that demonstrated a strong faith in God. How, preacher? Look at verse 18. For one thing, he leaned on the promise of God. Here's Abraham now who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be and being not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. How in the world, Brother Jerry, could a 99-year-old man believe that he was going to be a daddy? He's either a fool or he's a man of faith. 99 years old, and God shows up with a promised seed by the name of Isaac. God said it was going to happen. Abraham probably didn't understand, how, but he took God at his word. And he staggered not, Bible says, at the promise of God through unbelief. How can you believe God's going to take care of it? Because God said he would. 
You don't have to understand it to stand on it. Thank God there's a lot of things in this Bible I don't understand. But by faith, I just accept if God said what he meant, he meant what he said. And I can believe and stand on the promise of the word of God. And he leaned on that promise. And if you believe God tonight, I'm tell you, let me give you a little piece of advice. You can go home and you can pillow your head on the soft promise of the word of God. And you can have the best night's sleep you've had in a long time. You just believe God. He's going to take care of this thing. Somebody asked me if I watched the State of the Union last night. I caught about the last 10 minutes of it, I think it was. But somebody asked me, you going to watch it? I said, I see it every day at the gas pump, at the grocery store. I already see the State of the Union. Somebody help me right there, amen. But my faith is not in what goes on in Washington. My faith is not in a midterm election in November. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. We can lean on the promise of the word of God. But he not only leaned on the promise of God, look at verse 21, he looked to the power of God. Because he was persuaded, look what God did. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. God did what nobody else could have done. I mean, they wasn't a doctor. They, they wasn't any pills. They wasn't any technology. They wasn't any medication. God did what only God could do. Abraham believed God, fully persuaded that what God promised, God was also able to perform. God always responds to the faith of his people. If you trust him, you believe him, you know what God will do? God knows then. If, I, if you're going to take God at his word, then God knows I better do what I said I was going to do. Because if he don't do what he said he's going to do, he's a liar. And if he's a liar, all of us are bound for hell and there's no hope. But one thing God can't do, Titus 1 2, in hope of eternal life, God, who cannot lie, promise before the world begin. One thing God can't do is God cannot lie. And if God said he would do it and you exercise faith to believe in God, you said you'd take care of me, God says I better do it or else I'll be a liar and I can't lie. So I'll have to do what I promised and what I said I was going to do. And God responds to the faith of his people. And the same God that acted on the part of Abraham, look at verse 23, he's the same God that acts on our part as well. Now it was not written for his sake alone. That's helping me right there tonight. Everybody's singing, well now, preacher, that was Abraham and he's a great man of faith. Look at what Paul says. That didn't happen. wasn't written just for Abraham alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also. That's saying if God did it for Abraham, God's able to do it for you and for me. Not just for him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. That great British preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, a little faith can take your soul to heaven, but a great faith can bring heaven to your soul. A little faith can take your soul to heaven, but a great faith can put a little heaven in your soul to go to heaven in. Trust in God. Believe in God, knowing that if God said it, God will do, he has to do what he said. If he said he'd never leave me nor forsake me, he can't leave me. He can't forsake me. If he does, he's a liar, and he can't lie. So if he promised that he'd be with me to the end of the age, guess what? He's going to be with me all the way home. Oh, I can lean on the promise of God. I can look to the power of God and I don't have to understand it. I can't explain how a 99-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman could bring a child in this world. All I can say is, but God. I can't explain how in the world God can take a black heart, wash it in red blood, make it whiter than snow. All I can say is, but God. 
I didn't understand it all. That morning I got born again. All I knew is I was lost. I was on my way to hell, but I believe Jesus died on that cross for me. I wasn't thinking about anybody else. I know God so loved the world, but I wasn't thinking about the world that Saturday morning. I was thinking about me. I didn't want to go to hell. And I knew that if he loved the world, he had to love me. And by faith, I received that perfect gift called salvation. And down through all these years, I can testify to you tonight, God is faithful. God will keep his word. God will do what he said he would do. Jimmy Stewart was just a teenage boy. He enlisted in the Army Air Corps during World War II. And his father, Alex Stewart, he chose. At that time, he had no choice but to just trust his son to the hand of God. And as his boy, Jimmy Stewart, boarded that bus, headed to boot camp, his daddy put a letter, farewell letter that he'd wrote in his little bag there and he told him when you get where you go and you take that out and you read it that's my heart to you I, I, I could express it better on paper than I could tell you in person Jimmy Stewart got to his barracks laid in his bed that bunk that night he opened that letter and this is what his dad said my dear boy soon after you read this letter you'll be on your way to the worst sort of danger Jimmy, I'm banking on the enclosed copy that I put in this letter, a copy of Psalm 91. The thing that takes the place of fear and worry is the promise of these words, and I'm staking my faith in these words. I feel sure that God will lead you through this experience. I can say no more. I can only pray goodbye, my dear boy. God bless you and keep you. I love you more than I could tell you. Signed, Dad. Jimmy Stewart said that he took that letter. He put it under his hat every day for training, every day when he was called up to active duty. And he said he didn't know a lot about it at the time he read that letter, but he later learned after he read Psalm 91, he later learned to trust the words of that psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say of the Lord, he's my refuge, my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. He'll hide me under his wings and his, uh, his shield and buckler and he'll give his angels charge over me to keep me in all my way. He said, I learned to trust Psalm 91. Jimmy Stewart came home unharmed, a decorated war hero. He went on to fame on the big screen and movies and television. But he carried that letter, Brother Rodney, with him for the rest of his life. And when his daddy died, he took that letter and buried that letter with his daddy and had those words engraved on his daddy's tombstone. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all of thy ways. How can you believe that, preacher, by faith? Hold unto the promise of the word of God, believing that what God is able to perform, we trust him tonight by faith, knowing if he promised to save, he'll save. If he promised to secure, he'll secure. If he promised to supply, he'll supply. If he promised to sustain, he'll sustain. In the words of that old songwriter, there's no need to doubt him now. He'll make a way somehow. Safely this far, Jesus has brought me. There's no need to doubt him now. You can choose right now. You want to trust him? You trust him, I promise you. It makes life a whole lot easier to live. You just trust God and lean on the promise of his word. Or you can worry yourself sick, fretting, fearing, worrying, doubting, but all oh, Jesus says, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Though tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life, I'm never alarmed at the overcast sky. 
The master looks on at the strife. I know that he safely will carry me through no matter what evil be ties. Why should I then care though the tempest may blow if Jesus walks close to my side? My Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Help me now. I'm living by faith in Jesus above. Trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe, his sheltering arm. I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. And all God's people said amen. amen. Thank God for his word. I pray he'll seal it. I pray we'll leave her tonight with strong faith. Believe in the promise. What God has said, he's also able to perform. Thanks be unto God. Well, I'm glad I came tonight. I needed some of my own preaching. Hallelujah. I don't always enjoy my preaching, but I enjoy a little bit of it tonight. Praise the Lord. You didn't enjoy it, I enjoyed it for you too. Amen. Praise God. I can tell you this, God's been faithful to me. I haven't always been faithful to him, but he's, he's been faithful to me. I haven't always been there for him, but he's always been there for me. Thank God tonight we can live by faith. All right, anything else tonight? Any other announcements? Any other prayer requests? Suggestions? Complaints? Nothing? You glad you're saved? Amen. Amen. I can't even explain, Brother Robert, how a brown cow can eat green grass, give white milk, and yellow butter. I don't know how all that happens. And you probably don't either, but that don't keep you from going to the store and reaching in that cooler and getting out a half a gallon or a gallon of good old 2% milk or low fat or whatever your case might be. Skim, dear God in heaven. Ain't that the worst thing you've ever drank in your life? Skim milk, Lord Jesus in heaven. That, that, that would be the closest I'd come to believing in purgatory is having to drink skim milk, amen. But I don't understand, but I don't think about all that when you're buying milk or drinking milk. Don't think about all that. You just trust that Whoever got a hold of that, they did what they were supposed to do, and you trust that. Well, if I can trust Mayfield Dairy or Borden Dairy or whoever's in charge, of, surely I can trust the God that created the cow in the first place, and he put the grass on the ground for that cow to eat. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and every hill. He even owns every tater in the hill. Amen? Thank God we can live by faith. And I'll give you this and we'll be done. Do you know today that you exercise faith? It may have not been in God. You got up this morning, you flipped a switch. And you had faith that when you hit that switch, something was going to happen. You can't explain the physics of how all that current runs through those wires and those lines, but you had enough faith to believe if you'd flip that switch, light would come on. You went to a sink, you turned a knob on a faucet, you didn't understand how all that plumbing worked underneath the house and it come up. You just believed when you turned that knob, water was going to come out of that spigot. You got in your car to go to work. You either pressed the button or you turned the key. You didn't understand how all that overhead cam and them fuel injectors and all the everything that's in the components and the computer, that and motor worked together. You just believed that when you pushed it or you turned it, that that engine was going to crank. You could put it in drive and go on. We've had faith today. You come in here tonight, you sat down in that chair, you believe. You don't know who made that chair. 
You've never met the man who put the metal together and put the cushions together and sewed it all together. You don't know him, never met him. You can't explain how it all happened, but you believed if you'd bend your knees and you'd sit down, that chair would hold you up. Oh, you've had faith today. Here's my question. If I can believe in a light to come on through a switch. And if I can believe in water to come out through a sink, and if I can believe for an engine to crank in a car, and if I can believe a chair to hold me up, I can sit down. Surely I can believe in the God that brought it all in the beginning in the first place, amen. We've had faith, but our faith needs to be in the right source. And it needs to be in the God of heaven who's in charge of all these things. Well, praise the Lord. Brother Richard, it's good to have your friend with us tonight. And I know you all are as surprised as I am. Brother Richard had a friend. Amen. Praise God. No, we love Brother Richard. And brother, we're glad to have you tonight. Appreciate you coming. Thank the Lord you let him know before you leave tonight how glad you are he's here. And I uh, hope to see you, Lord willing, Sunday morning. Pray for me in another tough passage in that Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we'll be in verse 27. Jesus talking about adultery and fornication and divorce and all those things. It's tough stuff. You pray for me. I promise you, you probably won't enjoy hearing it anymore than I'll enjoy preaching it. But I thought about skipping around. I thought, no, God called me to preach the whole counsel of God. And it's in that Bible for a reason. And so you pray for me. Pray that God will help me as I study. Give us ears to hear as it's preached. Uh, but looking forward to a good day in the Lord this coming Sunday. All right, let's stand together tonight. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Man, my ear just unpopped. Praise God, I can hear. Hallelujah. Thank God. Y'all ever had that happen? Boy, that feels good, don't it? Hallelujah. Y'all sit down. I'm going to preach some more. Amen. I, I can finally hear now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Man, that felt good. Thank God. Huh? My brain may come out. I may not do that too hard. Thank God. Brother Rodney, if you would, pray for us tonight. Remember the ones we mentioned, of course, and ask the Lord to go with us and bring us back next appointed time. Please, sir.